When I met the gods in Asgard, I was very much marked by the story of the prophecy of Ragnarok. I carried it in the corner of my mind. High, just as High, and Third had only mentioned it briefly, but it had put a dent in my morale. However, it takes a lot to bring down the great Gylfi, king of Sweden. But still, the end of the world? That's inconceivable. When I asked the gods for such details, I really hoped everything would finally end well. I was a little naive. I'm Lance Geiger, the History Guy, and you're listening to Echoes of History, Ragnarok, a podcast inspired by the video game Assassin's Creed, Dawn of Ragnarok. How much do you know about Odin, Thor, Loki, and their companions? Do you really know them? Dive into Norse mythology alongside gods, elves, magical creatures, dwarves, and giants. A fantastic universe that guided the destiny of the valiant Vikings as much as it inspired the greatest authors. Episode 5, Ragnarok, Twilight of the Gods. Odin knew since the beginning, since he created the universe with his own hands, the father of all things knew that everything would eventually collapse. The prophecy of Ragnarok is clear, inevitable. One day, the doom of the gods will come. Odin tried everything to change the course of history. He himself has faced the worst monsters, and he has relied on Thor to curb the giant's ardor all the while striving to preserve the fragile balance of the Nine Realms. But even the father of the gods cannot go against destiny. I wouldn't say he is haunted by Ragnarok, but he does know about it, which is not the case for all the characters. Annalie Jarl Ehrman, lecturer in Norse Studies at the University of Khan. He knows Ragnarok is inevitable because you can't escape your fate. So his job is not to prevent Ragnarok altogether because he can't do that. His job is to prevent it as long as possible, so to speak. He knows the warning signs. He's always looking for those signs. He is obsessed by everything that happens around him because he has to know everything that's happening and when the end will come. In the end, the fatal blow came from Asgard. The murder of the beloved Baldr, orchestrated by Loki, set in motion the final act of the universe. Soon the gods see the first sign of Ragnarok when the Nine Realms sink into a relentless winter that lasts three years. The winds blow without interruption and cause infernal snowstorms. The men are frozen and nothing grows on the land, cracked with frost and ice. Famine lurks, war is brewing. Exhausted and hungry, the humans who have not yet been decimated begin to kill each other. The gods see the attacks and the plundering on the land of men multiplying. Worse still, family ties no longer mean anything. Brothers fight each other and sons fight fathers. The fateful day approaches. There's a kind of stark beauty in Ragnarok, which is the idea that everything must end. Eric Lacey, lecturer in language and literature at the University of Winchester. Remember, the gods are not, they are very powerful, but they are flawed creatures just like people are. And all creatures must come to an end at some point. And the way that the gods face Ragnarok, knowing about it, but still living their lives and indeed causing the actions that lead about to it, very much mirror how people would have lived their lives in medieval Iceland, in medieval Scandinavia, which is that they knew that death was inevitable. The darkness of winter is soon reinforced by an even deeper darkness. Fenrir, the giant wolf, who is also Loki's son, has himself fathered two children, Hati and Skoll, as big as him. For ages, they have tirelessly chased the sun and the moon. At the dawn of Ragnarok, this race ends. The two wolves swallow the two stars. Their light disappears, and with it, a feeling of desolation covers the world. An episode that the believers had predicted in their observation of the sky. The pagans called the Hyades, which is a part of the Taurus sign, uh, that the pagans called it the wolf's mouth. Gisli Sigurdsson, teacher researcher at the Arne Magnusson Institute in Reykjavik. That's a V-shaped star pattern. 
And this sign of the wolf's mouth is located right on the sun's path in the sky, where the sun is moving through in tune from right to left. So it's moving out of the mouth, really. So by midsummer, the sun has safely escaped this V-shaped mouth of the wolf in the sky, giving so the people of Scandinavia ample reason to celebrate the midsummer festival, which is um, highly regarded in Sweden still today. But it's not over yet because earthquakes are shaking the entire universe. Indrasil itself, the indestructible world tree, shakes with all its leaves, threatening the nine realms nestled between its branches. All living beings are terrorized by the deafening cacophony. Amidst the crashing mountains, Loki, the fallen god, and Fenrir, both captured by Asgard, break free from their chains. Meanwhile, Loki's other son, Jormungandr, the serpent of Midgard, leaves the sea to reach the land. The waves caught by the movements of his gigantic body engulf entire villages. All of a sudden, while the universe is in complete chaos, all creatures, men and gods, freeze. Heimdall has just blown his horn. This is the dreaded signal, the announcement of Ragnarok. Thanks to his sharp eyesight, Heimdall, who is in charge of watching over the Bifrost, the bridge that links Midgard to Asgard, sees hordes of ice giants coming from Jotunheim. Immediately, Odin gathers all the warriors of Valhalla. After a long wait, the time has come for them to fight. The enemy comes from everywhere, and the sky opens to let Surtur, the giant, pass. He leads the procession of fire giants straight from Muspelheim. As for the goddess Hel, she brings out all the dead of Helheim. Finally, Loki, determined to bring down the gods, appears on the horizon, leading a fleet of ships filled with the bloodthirsty giants. After all this time, the death of Ymir, the primordial giant, will finally be avenged. The Bifrost Bridge collapses under the weight of the ice giants, therefore they must fight elsewhere. All the fighters meet on the immense plain of Vigrid, more than 500 kilometers wide. The two camps, who have been waiting for this moment for so long, face each other. On one side, the giants of ice and fire, Loki and his monstrous children in the army of the dead. On the other side, the gods of Asgard, their army of warriors from Valhalla, supported by the faithful Valkyries, and the men of Midgard, all ready to fight. Odin, at their helm, is ready to fight too. Forget the time when he tried to avoid Ragnarok at all costs. Now he must throw himself, body and soul, into battle. Armed with Gugnir, his divine spear, Odin rushes towards Fenrir. The colossal wolf advances towards him with his mouth wide open, its lower jaw touching the earth and its upper jaw brushing the sky. The father of the gods fights majestically, but despite his power and strength, he finally gives in, swallowed by the gigantic wolf. It is an unthinkable scene for both gods and men alike. Odin, the father of all things, is dead. It is an overwhelming and solemn moment. But very quickly, far from giving up, all redouble their energy against their enemies. Vidar, one of Odin's son, rushes to Fenrir. He blocks the lower jaw of the wolf with his foot, shod with indestructible leather, and thrusts his sword into Fenrir's mouth to pierce his heart. Fenrir collapses, defeated at last. On his side, Thor faces Jormungandr. He knows the Midgard Serpent because he has already fought him once. Moreover, the God of Thunder has almost defeated him. The two enemies fight fiercely, and Thor seems to take the upper hand. Finally, he strikes the snake a final blow with his hammer Mjolnir. The monster collapses, but in his last effort, he bites the mighty warrior. Thor turns away from the corpse and takes nine steps before falling to poisoned by the venom. The gods have just lost their best asset, their protector. On the plains of Vigrid, the Dantian battle continues. Heimdall, the father guardian of the Bifrost, confronts Loki. The two gods are equal strength and kill each other. Loki has unleashed Ragnarok, but he will not see the end of it. Not far away, Surtur, the fearsome fire giant, wreaks havoc. 
He first gets rid of Freyr, who, despite being a god, is not exactly the best fighter. The Asgardians fall one after the other. It's the doom of the gods. Soon there's no one left to oppose the fury of Surtir. The giant plunges his huge flaming sword into the earth, and in one blow, Asgard is set ablaze, soon followed by the whole universe. It is the end. The emphasis on fire really seems to come from Christianity, just like the notion that at Judgment Day, hellfire will rain upon the earth and hell will open up and we'll see flames all over the earth. And it's not in Old Norse, but it's in a similar area in Old High German, in the, the language spoken in Germany about the same time that these stories were being written, composed, preserved in Old Norse. We have a text called the Muspili, and it's actually a Christian text about the end of the world, about doomsday, but they're using muspel, the word for this fire realm, to describe the end of day. So Christianity actually borrows the terms to refer to the end of times. And that shows the entrenched and prolonged contact that there was between these pagan religions and Christianity and the way that they mutually influenced each other. All traces of life have disappeared. All that Odin built has gone up in smoke. The gods are dead, the giants are gone, and all that remains is a devastated landscape. Even Idrisil is mostly reduced to ashes. However, in the deafening silence that follows the apocalypse, a rustling can be heard. A young human couple timidly descends from the branches of the world tree. Lif and Lifrasir had taken refuge in a corner of Idrisil, spared from the flames. After stepping on the hot, cracked ground, they look around, stunned and afraid. No matter how many times they call, no one answers. And for good reasons, they are the only survivors. Lif and Lifrasir, whose names mean life and desire for life, understand that their mission is to repopulate the world. However, they're not alone after all. Baldur, free from the world of the dead, joins what remains of Asgard with a new generation of gods. There is Hodor, his blind brother, as well as Magni, son of Thor. They are enlightened and warmed by the daughter of Sol. Before being devoured by the wolf, the goddess of the sun had conceived a child to replace her in the sky. Thanks to them, the new world will be even more beautiful. There is then this quiet optimism at the end of it, which is that Odin's children will eventually inherit the earth and there'll be a whole new cycle. So just as Odin originally inherited the world and had the gods and they had control of it and they uh, performed their great deeds, so Odin's children will do the same thing. And it's very much mirroring the cycle of time, like summer and winter, or like the progression of years, or like the, the following of generations. To come back to Baldur, he's one of the gods who survived Ragnarok. He seems to be destined to become the ruler of the New World, which can perhaps be interpreted as the New Christian Era, or at least a more peaceful world, perhaps. If order always rises from chaos, each survivor of Ragnarok will have to learn from it. The arrogance of the gods had led to their downfall. The universe is entitled to a second chance. It's up to the humans and the gods to seize it. And that, my friends, is the end. The end of my story, that is. For the end of the world, we still have some time. Before I left Asgard, the gods asked me to spread their stories around me. And now I have. You know everything. I hope that, like me, you will learn the right lessons from these stories of gods and giants. Perhaps you will be inspired by the exploits of Thor. Or will you be aghast at Odin's arrogance? Maybe Loki's twists and turns will push you in the right direction, unlike him. The Norns have woven your destiny, yes. But there's no reason you can't unravel the threads yourselves. Thank you for listening to Echoes of History, Ragnarok, a Ubisoft podcast brought to you by Paradiso Media.